Hello there. Welcome to um, Bible study. We call it T and T, and we are certainly appreciative that you are joining us as far as our live stream is concerned. And we thank God for your presence. And we pray uh, that you have had a good week thus far. And I am excited to be sharing with you as far as Ephesians chapter 6, uh, starting at verse 10. Before we get started, though, let me, if I could, uh, lift you all in a word of prayer so that you can uh, hopefully and prayerfully be able to glean what it is that the Lord would have for you to, to, to gather at this time. God, we come to you and we thank you for another wonderful opportunity to be able to study your word, to be able to um, glean from you, to be able to hear from you. The study of your word is one of the primary ways, oh God, that we hear from you. And so we pray right now, God, that by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, you will be with us. Give us the insight that we so desperately need as far as hearing your word. Your word reminds us he or she who hath hear, ear, let him or her hear what the Spirit has to say. It is my prayer that during this time of, of teaching that your daughters and sons will hear what you have to say, and that we will apply this word to our lives so that we can be better disciples for you. So show yourself mighty and strong, and we'll bless your name in that. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Yeah. So today we want to pick up on Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to focus on verses um, 10 and I want to go through verse 17 for today, and then next week we will finish up Ephesians um, chapter 10, starting at verse 18 through the end of this chapter. And as far as today's sharing is concerned, this is a, a wonderful in-depth opportunity that uh, you and I have to, to partake of when it comes to the Word of God. So, Starting at Ephesians chapter 10, as we look at this particular text, we find these words printed, and I'm going to read, and I'm going to ask you if you would highlight um, these uh, words or phrases uh, for your own particular study. So we're going to do what I call some, some good exegetical work, uh, digging in the text, and then getting a sense for what the Lord will do as far as this time is concerned. Starting at verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I want you to highlight that whole verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Starting at verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. I want you to uh, circle the phrase whole armor that you may be able to stand. I want you to underline the phrase, you will be able to stand against. I want you to highlight the phrase again, highlight the word against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle, I want you to underline, we do not wrestle against. I want you to highlight the word against. Flesh and blood, underline flesh and blood. But against, I want you to highlight against. Principalities, underline principalities. Against, circle against, or highlight against rather. Powers, underline powers. Highlight the word against the rulers of darkness of this age. Underline that. Against. Um, highlight that. Spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Underline that phrase. Spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor. Circle the phrase whole armor. And I want you to draw a line from verse 13, whole armor, to verse 11, whole armor. As a matter of fact, do me this favor. In verse 11, uh, circle, uh, make that whole armor of God. 
And in verse 13, make that whole armor of God. That you will be able to withstand in the evil day and haven't done all to stand. I want you to underline the phrase to stand in verse 13. Verse 14, stand. I want you to underline that and draw a line from stand in verse 14 to stand in verse 13. Verse 14, stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Highlight, having girded your waist with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, underline the breastplate, or highlight rather, the breastplate of righteousness. 15, having your, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Highlight the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, take on the shield of faith. Highlight the phrase shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 17, and take on the helmet of salvation. Highlight the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Highlight the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We'll stop right there for today's um scripture lesson okay so as we get ready to talk about the whole armor of god and we want to unpack this in a very meaningful way um i just want to let you all know that paul is encouraging those of us who are believers uh to be strong in the lord and in the might of the lord this phrase be strong in the lord and the might of the lord is the power that overcomes resistance as used in christ's miracles all right so we're being basically told that believers can be strengthened not only as not only by the person of the lord but also by the resources that the lord brings to bear on us as far as whatever situation we're dealing with all right when we look at um the continuing rest of this text, we're told to put on the whole armor of God. Now, interestingly, this is not our armor, it's God's armor, <laughs> okay? It's not our armor, it's God's armor. Our armor is gonna fail, okay? Cause our armor got dents. It's got dings, it's got holes, it's got deficits and deficiencies. But we're told to put on the whole armor or the full armor of God. All right. Now this is really connected. And Paul is using the imagery of the Roman soldier. All right. That we are told that we will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That's where the concept wows is. The concept wows basically means the schemes or the methodologies or the strategies of the enemy. All right. Without God's armor, we're going to be defeated against what the enemy is going to bring our way. None of us have been able to withstand the schemes of the devils for thousands of years. And so when we don't have on the armor of God and we don't have the strategy of God, we're going to fall. And we got to understand that this struggle that we're dealing with is not physical. It's not against men and women. It is spiritual. It's almost against like a spiritual mafia. <laughs> um, and so the, the devil will throw all the satanic forces he can against you and me to try to get us off course and out of our purpose. All right. Now, let's get ready to really start digging deep as far as this particular word is concerned. This is what I want you to understand, that the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you get on the devil's hit list, all right? You and I, the moment we say yes to Jesus Christ, and we're serious about living for Jesus Christ, we get on the devil's hit list. And interestingly, the enemy considers us to be armed and dangerous because we have God on our side. So as we unpack this, I want you to understand that Paul right now is addressing, 
when he says, finally, my brethren, and this includes women as well, Paul is talking to the saints of God, okay? He is giving a charge uh, to those of us who belong to Jesus Christ. This is not to the people in the world or the culture, and this is not to worldly people in the church. Now, you do know that you can have worldly people in the church, that there are people who are what I would call carnal Christians. Paul is talking to those who are serious about trusting God and believing God, just not being carnal Christians, meaning that we're saved, but we do whatever we want to do. All right. Now, let's further unpack this because he wants us to understand that when we are connected to Jesus Christ, that we have strength in God and the power of his might. We have strength in the person of the Lord and we have strength in the resources that God brings to bear on our situation. All right, this, this strength and this power is designed to help us stay in the fight when we get hit the hardest. We may get knocked down, but the strength and the power of the Lord will pick us back up and prop us up. All right. Now, let's 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 talk about what that strength of the Lord is and what the source of the power is. That is none other than Jesus Christ. Okay, it's not any tricks, it's not any games, it's none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus is the source of our strength. It reminds me of that song, you are the source of my strength, you are the strength of my life. Um, Jesus Christ is in us and we are in Christ. And so because Christ is in us and we are in Christ, there's a connection. And because of that connection, then you and I have strength and power through Christ. Not of ourselves, but through Christ. Let me say that again. Not of ourselves, but through Jesus Christ. I believe it was Zechariah um, chapter 4, verse 6, that says, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You and I cannot do anything as far as the work of God is concerned unless it is through the strength and the power of God's spirit. If you rely on your own might and power and strength, you're going to fail. And it's interesting to note that Paul reminds us, uh, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, particularly verses 7 through 10, Paul reminds us that in our weakness, God's strength is perfected, okay? So let's look at verse 11 as we start really drilling down on this particular passage of scripture. Now, I kind of gave a summary a few minutes ago. Now we're going to do the drill down as far as this reality is concerned. Remember, I told you where to put on the whole armor of who? the whole armor of God, not your armor, okay? God's armor. Our armor, unfortunately, is connected to money, maybe political power, education, socioeconomic status, whatever clubs or organizations we belong to. We think that those things are the source of power and they arm us. However, we're told in this particular passage that we're put on the whole armor of God. And as we put on the whole armor of God, uh, when Christ saves us, Christ is really calling us to be part of an army. Now, interestingly today, there are some people who don't like to lift up this motif of being in an army or being in a fight or being on the battlefield. Um, uh, we, we want a peaceable, <laughs> a peaceable Christ. We want a, 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 a peaceable God. 
But in this text, we're really being outfitted and we're really understanding that we're in a fight. We are in a fight. Let me say that again. We are in a fight. And the interesting thing is that in this fight, we have weapons. Okay? In this fight, we have weapons. God, through Christ, is our commander-in-chief, and we're on the battlefield for him. Now, I also want you to understand that when you get serious about trying to live for God through Jesus Christ, you are going to be attacked. Okay? You are public enemy number one when it comes to the devil. And you're going to be attacked. If you're not attacked, you may not be part of the army. If you're not attacked, you may not necessarily be saved. When you're serious about living for God, you are going to be attacked. It's part for the course. Okay? All of us have some scheduled attacks on our itinerary. All right? Now, we're told to put on the whole arm of God so that we'll be able to stand against the methods, the strategies of the devil. That's what the world wiles, W-I-L-E-S means. Those are methods and strategies. And oftentimes, the methods and strategies of the devil are laced with lies, is laced with deceit. Okay? This is why I believe the Apostle Peter wrote that you and I ought to be sober ever watching because our adversary, the devil, as a warring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. Okay? The enemy has his sights on us. All right? So, with these attacks scheduled, we got to understand that the warfare is not human or physical. Paul says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are dealing with active spirits commanded and ruled by the devil. Now, here's another thing that I want to throw at you all, because we have people in today's culture, in today's society in 2020, who don't believe in the spiritual realm. They don't believe in the supernatural. Uh, they say that's a bunch of hogwash. But I want you to understand that when you and I are serious about following God, we are engaging in supernatural warfare. And this understanding of supernatural warfare, we got to understand that there is God's side and then there is the side of the devil. And when we understand that, we got to realize that we're in a fight. And notice the language that is being used. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle, okay, against flesh and blood. This is a contest between opponents. That term wrestle is an athletic term. It is, it is a depiction of Olympic wrestlers back in the day. Now you got to, you and I got to understand that the forces of evil are strong and they're numerous. Okay? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers or darkness of this age. When one thinks about the term darkness, it, it is really in reference to being ignorant of truth. It is being a uh, void of the light. Okay. These forces are after the spirit of humanity who have been created to worship and serve God. 
Now, while it's true that the warfare is not against flesh and blood, but these evil forces, these evil spirits, often reside in human bodies. Okay? The spirit does not do anything in and of itself. It works through various chains of human bodies. And I would dare say that those human bodies help to set up human institutions, human structures, and human systems that we find ourselves having to fight against. Okay, human institutions are not disconnected to human bodies. Human is systems are not disconnected to human bodies. Human structures are not disconnected to human bodies. So when we talk about systems and structures, particularly when we talk about oppressive systems and structures, they are always connected to a human body, a human concept, a human thought. Okay. Now, I just have one question, though, because I want to wrestle with just for a moment that if you and I are serious about serving God, if you and I are sons and daughters of God, then it, it would seem unfair that if we're serving the Lord, that the Lord will allow for us to have to deal with this type of stuff. <laughs> but I want you to understand that God allows the enemy to strike. Okay? Now, all you just got to do is remember the story of Job. If you don't believe that God allows the enemy to strike. All you got to do is just go back to Job chapter 1 and 2, and you will see that Job was minding his own business. Job was a man who feared God, who despised evil. Job was such a devout man of faith until he made sacrifices to the Lord every day, not only on his behalf, but also on behalf of his sons and daughters, lest they sin also. So, so Job really trusts God. And, and Satan, and the term Satan basically means the accuser, the adversary, one day the sons of God were having a meeting in heaven and Satan shows up and God says to Satan, you know, what you doing here? And Satan said, I've just been going up and down the earth seeking who I made the power. And God says, have you ever checked out Job? And Satan said, yeah, I have, but you got a hedge around him. He said, if you move that hedge, he'll cut you to your face. And God said, all right. He said, have at it, but you can't touch his body. So God permits the enemy to strike. Now, why does God do that? Why, why, does, why does God allow for bad things to happen to good people? Why does God permit the enemy to mess with us? Let me, if I could, just give you two fundamental reasons. The first one is to grow us. You'll never know how to use your power if you're not in a fight. <laughs> You'll never know how to use your tools of warfare if you're not in a fight. And so there's a difference between training and engaging in a fight. Any boxer will tell you that you can train as much as you want to, but there's a difference between training and being in an actual fight. It is when you're in an actual fight with the enemy that you see different things that you don't necessarily see in training. So we grow through that aspect. So one of the reasons that we find ourselves in the, in, in, under the attack at times is it's God's way of allowing us to grow. The other way may be to also humble us. You know, interestingly, some of us can get kind of haughty, but everything goes smoothly. And we think it's all about us. 
And there are times when the Lord will allow for us to go through some things to be humble. If you don't believe me, all you just got to do is think about Paul. Paul, again, going back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said, I was caught up in third heaven. I saw some stuff that I can't even articulate in speech. And then he said, um, I, and if I'm not careful, I will exalt myself because I've had all these major revelations. And I was given a thorn in my flesh. And the thorn was a messenger from the devil, a messenger from Satan to buffet me unless I put myself above everything else. So there are times when the Lord will allow for, for these strikes to remind us, number one, we ain't in heaven yet. <laughs> And number two, we're not all that. So there's a humility that comes with this. There's a humility that comes with this. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many connections you have politically and socially and financially. Attacks are going to come. And when the attack come, there are times you can't depend upon that stuff. You got to depend upon God. So, so there are times when the attacks will happen to keep us humble, to keep us praying, to keep us seeking our God. All right. So what happens when when we have to stand against the wiles of the enemy? What happens when we have to wrestle against flesh and blood, number one, against principalities, number one, against powers, number three, against the rulers of darkness of this age, number four, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, number five. Five things. Five things. All right. So since we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, even though these powers and principalities and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness and high places embodies flesh and blood, you and I have to have a different mentality when it comes to the fight. You fight against principalities and powers with a higher principality and a greater power. And trust me, that higher principality and that greater power is not of us. You don't fight darkness with more darkness. You fight darkness with light. Okay? You don't necessarily fight fire with more fire. You fight fire with water. We're reminded that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay? So now, here's the crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing. Because the victory of, for the Christian soldier has nothing to do with destroying the enemy. The goal is to keep us standing. <laughs> All right. You and I do not defeat the devil in the truest sense of defeat. God's going to deal with him one day. We're just told to stand. You missed that. The mere fact that you stand against the enemy, the mere fact that you stand against whatever the enemy throws your way, ultimately weakens the enemy, ultimately causes the enemy to want to go crazy because while the enemy is trying to kill you, you keep standing. 
right? That's in verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you will be able to withstand in the evil day and have it done all to stand. Doesn't say winning the fight, it just says to stand. Because ultimately the victory belongs to the Lord, not to us. So if you're able to stand against whatever the enemy throws your way, in and of that is victory, but the truest defeat of the devil does not come from us. It comes from God. God's going to deal with him one day. All right? So let's look at what our weapon, or weapons, should I say, are. You and I got certain weapons at our disposal. All right? So let's talk about the first one. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. All right? Girded your waist with truth, the belt of truth. All right? Now, again, this is the image of a Roman soldier as far as tools of warfare are concerned. So this is what Paul is talking about. So you, you, you have to go back to that imagery of the Roman soldier. We don't necessarily have that type of imagery in today's army because our equipment, our weapons are a whole lot more sophisticated, okay? We have guns. Um, uh, we have um, uh, bulletproof vests and things of that sort, all right? But back then, you have this image of a Roman soldier. And it's interesting to note that we start off with a belt. And that soldier's belt is truth. And the purpose of the belt is to keep the armor in place and to protect the lower part of the soldier's body. All right, so notice what it says, having girded your waist with truth. Notice truth is the first piece of armor that we're called to put on. Why truth? And why a belt? Because what we must understand is that the devil is the father of lies. And we got to have the truth and know the truth to combat the enemy. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. Jesus said that you shall know the truth and the truth that shall set you free. So when Jesus came, truth arrived. All right? All right? So you and I got to know what truth is. So truth is more than just a proposition or a concept. Truth is a person. And truth being a person is wedded to the very essence of the word of God. So we got to have truth. And we got to know what that truth looks like. And Jesus being truth, oftentimes informs us when we're listening to what real truth is versus what a lie is, all right? I want to dare say that another way for you and I to know what truth is is that we need to be in the word of God. Now, when we talk about this understanding of truth, because we're living in a time and a day where the concept of truth has gone off the rails. You hear people talk about you got to live your truth. You got to speak your truth. You can't deny your truth. When oftentimes the concept of live your truth, speak your truth, don't deny your truth, is your own personal preference. 
it is disconnected from objective truth. Okay? And when we disconnect our concepts of morality and ethics from objective truth, we are in trouble. Because basically it becomes anything goes. And that's how the enemy tricks us. Because the enemy will tell us, all you got to do is just live your truth. And oftentimes, our truth goes against the truth of God. Let me say that again. Our truth goes against the truth of God. So that's why you got to gird your waist with truth. So that's the first, first piece of armor. Second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate of righteousness protected the upper portion of the body of the Roman soldier from the neck to the thighs, all right? It, it's, it's the biggest piece of armory, armor rather, as far as the Roman soldier is concerned. And it protects uh, one of the most vital organs of the human body, the heart. Okay? So we now see that the breastplate of righteousness, after we have been girded, watch this, with truth, breastplate of righteousness guides our heart, our heart, basically is connected to the feelings or to the emotional center of our being. All right. The breastplate of righteousness. In other words, righteousness, when we are connected to Jesus Christ, because here again, just as truth is connected to Jesus, righteousness is also. Paul tells us, for Jesus Christ was made to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. All right, again, righteousness is connected to Christ, but there's also a moral righteousness, a moral righteousness, all right? In other words, doing the right thing, okay? doing the right thing. All right. So we got the belt of truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. Then there's another part of the armor. All right. And it is basically sandals with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Sandals. All right, because the Roman soldiers did not wear boots back then, but sandals. And, and the sandals that they wore back then, um, according to some archaeological digs, those sandals had little spikes in them that were able to grip the ground so that when they ran, they would not fall or slip as far as wet, con not concrete, wet, wet, uh, uh, brick slabs or, or anything like that, but they will be able to grip the ground. All right. All right. Now it's interesting to note that whenever the Roman soldier took his rest, that they would take off the, the belt of truth, they would take off the breastplate, but they never removed their sandals. <laughs> because the sandals were a sign of readiness to march and do battle. In other words, when they were on the battlefield, their sandals remained on their feet even while they slept. Okay? Now notice what we are to wear. We're to wear the preparation of the gospel of peace. The concept of gospel is good news good news all right the good news of jesus christ and the good news of jesus christ brings peace this basically means that 
you and I must be willing, be prepared to share the gospel at any time, right? We have to be prepared to share the gospel at any time. All right? So we got the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness. We got the sandals of the gospel of peace. All right? Okay. Then we also have the shield of faith. All right, the shield of faith. The shield of the Roman soldiers basically was, they were huge, it was large enough to almost cover the whole body. And particularly when the Roman soldiers were in battle and they would walk side by side, those shields would come together and form a wall. All right. The real test that shows whether or not the Christian soldier is found in this verse is all about faith. Faith is your shield. All right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is your shield. All right? Trust in God, that's your shield. Because when you're able to trust God, then whatever the enemy throws your way, you're able to deflect because of your faith, your trust in God. All right? James tells us that we are to count whatever we're going through with joy when we fall into different kinds of temptation knowing the trying of our faith works patience. All right? So whenever we go through temptations, we're really called to put up the shield of faith, the shield of trust, because God always gives us a way out of the temptation. When we think about Peter, Peter, the apostle Peter, when Jesus was on earth, Jesus came to Peter and said, Simon, Satan wants you. He wants to sift you as wheat. I pray for you that your faith fails not. I pray that your faith fails not. I pray that your trust in God through me fails not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brother. Paul reminds us, he says, listen, I, I'm getting ready to face Nero's chopping block. I, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. We use the shield of faith, the, our trust in God to be able to stop the, watch this, fiery darts that the enemy throws our way. Now, what happens when those darts hit the shield of faith? They are extinguished. When those darts hit the shield of faith, they're put out. Okay, when those darts hit the shield of faith, they're gone. All right. Sometimes we may need to take inventory of our shield and see how many darts that the enemy has thrown our way. Sometimes after we've been on the battlefield, we need to take inventory of those darts and just start pulling the darts out because they didn't kill you, they didn't kill you. The shield of faith, which quenched all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Then notice in verse 17 where Paul says, we got to put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Watch this. So 
We got the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, which goes on the head. Now the breastplate and that helmet are two important things because the enemy is always trying to shoot us in the head to take us out. All right. When Paul speaks of the helmet of salvation, he's really looking at the helmet of the Roman soldier that's worn into battle. Because if the Roman soldier has a blow to the head, that could be fatal. A blow to the head could take a soldier out. Now, if you if you don't have the breastplate of righteousness, because remember, breastplate of righteousness covers the heart, it covers your stomach, covers your torso, it goes out. You know, you, you can get hit in your chest and survive. But if you get hit in the head, it can take you out. So the helmet of salvation helps the believer to be able to stand mentally because the devil will attack our mind. The enemy will come after our thoughts. The enemy starts flooding our mind with negativity. The enemy will convince you that you're not saved. And if the devil ever convinced you that you're not saved, he got you. Got you. And say that again. He got you. If you know you've confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you meant that in your head and your heart, you're saved. But even after that, there are times when the enemy will come our way and will let us and say, you know, you sin, so you really ain't saved. Because this is what the Word of God says. All right? You and I are brought with a price, bought with a price. We didn't, we didn't earn salvation. God gave it to us. All right. So we got to have this helmet to protect our thoughts from the influence of the devil and from the interference of the devil. That's why he is called the accuser. Can't fall for the tricks. You don't lose your salvation because you commit a sin after God has saved you. Okay. Now I want you to follow me because I'm getting ready to go somewhere else with this. Not only do we have to prevent the enemy from getting in our minds and our thought in our head, but the helmet of salvation also seals the word of God in our thoughts, in our minds, so that we can have new thoughts. That's why Paul said, don't conform to the ways of this world. Roman chapter 12, verse 1, 2. Don't conform to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is why you got to renew your mind every day. That's why you need to have devotional time with God. Every day, you need to get some word in you. Every day, you need to have prayer every day. Why? Because your mind needs to be renewed. The word of God becomes food for thought. Because here's what I want to impress upon you, that when you think right, you start living right. When your mind is changed, your behavior will change. When your behavior is changed, your actions will change. When your actions will change, the outcomes will change. But it starts with right thinking. Okay? It starts with right thinking. Now, all of these previous mentioned weapons are defensive. We only got one offensive weapon, <laughs> the sword. The sword 
is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. All right. All the weapons I mentioned before are defensive. We only have one offensive weapon. That's the word of God. That's our offensive weapon. We are to use the sword, the word of God, to attack the enemy. And we can go on the offensive with that. The principalities, the powers, the rulers, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places cannot stand against the word of God. We're told in the Bible that the word of God is a quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. That means that blade is on both sides of the sword. You can cut going and coming. Okay? You cut going and coming. It's a double-edged sword. Cut going and coming. All right? Now, notice that we don't have anything to protect our back. The back is exposed. All right, that breastplate of righteousness does not cover the back. It just covers the front. All right, the helmet has a visor on it, covers the front. Now, what happens to the back? Why is the back exposed? Two reasons. Number one, as a soldier, you don't turn your back to the enemy and retreat. You face the enemy and fight. Number two, God has your back. Okay? God has your back. Let me say that again. God has your back. As a soldier, you don't turn your back to the enemy. You fight the enemy. Face forward. If you ever notice a boxer, a boxer is always fighting forward. It doesn't turn his or her back to the enemy. As part of the army of God, we don't go in retreat mode. We face, why? Because we got a lot of defensive weapons. Only one offensive weapon, which is the word of God. I would dare say, and I close on this, that you can have all of those defensive mechanisms, but if you don't have the word of God, you have nothing to fight with. If you don't sharpen your sword, you have nothing to fight with. You can have truth as your belt. You can have righteousness as your breastplate. You can have the gospel as your sandals, or you can have Faith is your shield. You can have salvation as your helmet. But if you don't have anything to fight with, you're constantly in defensive mode. And we're called to be on the offense. We're called to be able to stand and dish out what God has given us through the word. That's what we're called to do. We only got one offensive weapon, you all. It's not a gun. It's not a missile. <laughs> uh, it's a sword. It's a sword. It's the word of God. 
And when you read the Gospels, particularly when Jesus was experiencing the temptation by Satan in the wilderness, every time Satan came at Jesus, Jesus pulled out the sword three times with these wonderful words, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's how the, that's how he dealt with it. It is written. It is written. It is written. Well, I close out this portion of study and I pray that you all have been hopefully and prayerfully blessed uh, by this sharing. Uh, next week we will conclude our study of Ephesians. And we pray that you will join us on next Thursday to see how Paul pulls all of this together that we've been studying over the past several months. I wanna close this out in prayer. And as I prepare to do that, what I want to do is to let you all know that here at St. Paul, we have been praying for you and with you. We realize that it's been very hard being apart from one another as far as our church gathering is concerned. And yet, when we are going back into the sanctuary, I, I don't know. Here in North Carolina in general and in the Charlotte Mecklenburg area in particular, our numbers continue to go up. Uh, I'm not gonna take the risk of bringing us back together anytime soon. Uh, I pray that you all will continue to join us online um, because we have a long way to go. And so we need your prayers very, very much during this time. And as we prepare to lift up in prayer, uh, the staff and the ministers and the deacons, uh, we're doing all that we can to maintain communication and connection. If you feel led to give, um, you can give as far as Bible study is concerned through our giving app, Givelify, or through the website. Or if you want to mail you're giving to the church. You can mail it to the church, 1401 Allen Street, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205. That information is at the bottom of the screen. However, if you have lost your job because you've been laid off or because of the pandemic or you've been furloughed, we don't expect for you to give. Again, we're asking those of us who have some modicum of income for us to bear the infirmity of our brothers and sisters. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, close out this moment of study. God, we come and we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to learn what our weapons in this warfare are all about. I pray, oh God, that this word that's been shared will was a blessing to those who have tuned in I pray that those who have watched will share it on their platforms with others. God, allow for us to wear our weapons and allow for us to use that weapon that you've given us in love. Now, God, as we leave from this time of study, we pray that you will bless those who are watching, bless their families, encourage their hearts and their strength right now in strength right now. We love you, O oh God, and the truth that we know in these uncertain times is that Jesus is alive and he's with us even as we endure these times of uncertainty. Dismiss us from this time of study, but never from your presence and keep us in your care, O oh God. It's in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. 
listen, blessings upon you all. Take care of yourselves. God bless you all. And we pray that you all will join us for Sunday morning live, whatever class you are attending, as well as our Sunday morning worship virtually at 1030. God bless you all. Take care. Love you and you miss you. Be blessed. What a time in worship, family. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Reverend Kelly Baptist, and here's what's happening with St. Paul. The 2020 census has been extended to October 31st. The results of the census will help determine how hundreds of billions of federal funding flows into communities every year for the next decade. That funding shapes many different aspects of every community, no matter how big or small, no matter where they're located. So join me in taking a vital step to shaping the future of our community. Go to 2020census.gov for more details and fill out the census form for every person who lives in your household. It just takes a few minutes and those few minutes can change the rest of your life. Join us each Wednesday at 8.15 for a quick 15. A quick 15 is a brief time to connect with Pastor Scott and the St. Paul family in prayer and devotion. Dial 425-585-7753 to participate. And if you call in at 8 p.m., you'll be able to chat with our other St. Paul family members who are already on the line right before the call starts at 8.15 sharp. It's yet another way to stay connected as a church family during these social distance times. So we'll meet you on the line for a word and prayer on Wednesday. See you then. Join us for TNT this Thursday. You can watch from YouTube, the church website, or Facebook. You can even dial in by phone. So grab your Bible and notepad and study with us this Thursday in our power pack Thursday noon or Thursday night teaching. It's TNT time. Don't miss your moment. Turn up Tuesdays with our Impact Kids, Youth, and Families is at 5 p.m. Say that, 5 p.m. during the summer. We want our young people and their families to stay connected. We know y'all are missing your children and youth church buddies. Reverend C has been on fire and having a great time with our Impact 1401 ministry. And that party rocks on all summer long, so don't miss it. Keep getting pumped, fam. Your testimonials about your push to do better with your physical temple have been inspiring people all over. And we are proud of everyone working to be St. Paul fit. Keep it up. Monday's uploads drop at 3.30 p.m. Just in time for an afternoon workout. Get your water, get your towel, and let's get St. Paul fit. <laughs> The deadline for the Gregory K. Moss Scholarship submission has been extended until July 1st, 2020. That's less than a month away, y'all. Contact the Deacon's Ministry for an application. Patricia Chambers or LaVon Sessions have email addresses that you can reach out to to submit your application. Teachers are needed. Are you ready for a temporary teaching assignment? Are you tech savvy? Do you love kids and want to help them understand more about Jesus? We need you. Come and join us as we prepare to offer an online vacation Bible school. I've got this with Jesus from July the 13th to July the 16th. We need you if you are willing to teach or provide tech support this summer. It is a great way to serve. If you are interested in being a part of this wonderful opportunity to share Jesus Christ with young children and teens and youth at St. Paul Baptist Church, contact Reverend Brenda Richardson 
at her email address at vrichardson at svbcnc.org. Or you can call her on the church phone at 704-334-5309, extension 113. On Saturday, July the 25th at 9 o'clock a.m., we will host our annual church conference virtually online Saturday, July the 25th, 2020 at 9 o'clock a.m. During this meeting, we will present our budget numbers for our 2021 fiscal year. This will be an invitation-only event where the disciples of St. Paul will have to register to attend. A mass email will be sent out shortly after today's worship service so you can register today to attend via webinar through your computers, smart devices, or calling in on your phone. Please note, our church board has sent out a survey to all young adults ages 18 to 40. Shoot up his tent. In order to hear directly from you, this is your chance to make your voice heard. We want to hear your opinions. We want to talk about how you would like for St. Paul Baptist Church to connect with you. We want to know what you need. Your input is so valuable to us, and we sincerely want to know what you think and what you want. Look out for that email coming directly from the church, or if you haven't gotten it, you can fill out the survey form through a link found on the church website. And that's what's going on. Please stay home and stay safe as we worship and fellowship together in a variety of ways. We certainly miss you and look forward to when we can all come together again. In the meantime, check out the church website or contact the church office for more details if you have any questions. Also, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Vimeo, YouTube, Instagram. We got you covered. This has been your St. Paul News, and until next time, be blessed.